Detective Podcast by Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. My name is Evan Transu, aka Detective Ev, and I will be your host for today's show. We got a really special guest and a special topic, and I don't mean that as just typing something up. It really is different than normal. And if you saw the title, you probably already realized that. We have with us someone who is a marketing genius, um, definitely does a lot of stuff behind the scenes at FDN, has been great friends with Reed for years, and so many of the things that we've done, whether or not you guys realize it, um, have actually come from our guest today. So it's going to be interesting there. One other thing I want to say is if you're normally tuning in for the health stories, it's not something we're going to be touching much on today at all. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on are the people that aspire to have their own health coaching business or FDN business, or maybe you already currently have that. We're going to be touching on all of those things. And Dr. Al, before I read more about you and just I want to get to the title because I know our audience so well and I have to specify something. Obviously, we have a catchy title of how to get clients to say yes. My friends, I know some of you are not as into the business side. You got into this stuff for health and then you realize, wait, I have to also learn business to go do this as work. You never wanted to do that. How to get clients to say yes does not mean this. It does not mean getting people who should never have given you any money because they don't belong in your program to get uh, give you money. It does not mean getting people who you cannot help in a genuine way to give you money. That's not what that means. What this means, or I'm sure it can mean many things, but one of the main things it means to me is how to get the people who get on a call with you or who are looking at your stuff that actually need you. You can benefit their life. You could even change it with the stuff that you know. You want to get them to say yes. Because I can't tell you out, out of the seven years of doing this, how many people I've talked to on the phone that, you know, they are they got their guard up nowadays because there's so many people offering them stuff. So I'm sitting there on the phone thinking, oh my God, I can help this person, but they don't necessarily believe me that I could help them. They think I'm going to be their 10th practitioner. So we're looking for the people that we have qualified. We know we can help in an ethical way. We know that if they spent the money with us, they'd be saying that was the best money I ever spent. That's who we're trying to get to say yes. So quick bio, and then we'll jump into it. Uh, this gentleman here has an extensive bio. So we're going to put it in the YouTube description afterwards. It'll also be on Facebook. And if you're listening to the audio version of this um, a couple weeks after <coughs> we do the live, then you will get to read it there as well. So Alan Weinstein ran a state-of-the-art waiting list multidisciplinary multi-physician practice for over 25 years, combining neurology, radiology, exercise rehabilitation, biochemistry, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and chiropractic. He had so many referrals that he had to refer them to other physicians in his area as he was unable to keep up with the demand for the wellness care he created. That is a good problem to have. He was <laughs> one of the first physicians to achieve three separate certifications in exercise rehabilitation in the United States. He served on the Quality Assurance Committee of the American Chiropractic Association, where he formulated the rehabilitation guidelines from which all, uh, all other chiropractic physicians had to adhere. He completed the ACA Neurology Diplomat Program and was honored as valedictorian of his class. He has achieved certifications in ADHD and learning disabilities, vertigo, applied kinesiology, hair tissue mineral analysis, detoxification, metabolic typing, and functional diagnostic nutrition. Now, this goes on for several more paragraphs. Again, you guys can read all that stuff. I think it's going to be self-evident as he's talking today on the expertise that this guy has. So, Dr. Al, thank you for my uh, allowing my long-winded intro. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much. And Evan, I want to say I'm really honored that you chose me to be on the show with you. I do follow what you do, and I have tremendous respect for you and, of course, for Reed and for FDN. I love the Detective Ev um, title that you gave yourself or someone gave you. I thought that was really great. And I think that the intro that you gave or what we're going to try to accomplish today, I think it's going to give people a different perspective than they're used to because we're going to hit it hard from really the marketing aspect of dealing with people. Because one of the things that I think people miss is they just make an assumption that everyone's like them or have the same challenges as them. And they don't really realize that everyone's unique in their own way. So you can't bring what is appealing just to you, to everybody you speak to, because you won't get the yes. You'll maybe get at best indecision. 
Yeah, and we, um, Dr. Al actually prepared some slides for us today. So even if you're on audio, there's still stuff to get from this. And you can always go back to the YouTube. Just go to the show notes and we'll have the link there by the time you're listening to this and you could watch the slides. But before we even get into that, Dr. Al, I just wanted to get um, a little background just to show people, you know, how you got into this. Because if you listen to your bio, they would have noticed that, okay, you're a chiropractor or have been a chiropractor, and then you did all this other stuff. So you're actually kind of similar to many of us in at least the sense that you joined the health profession, probably not setting out to be some like marketing guru, but then you found this love of the business side and realized, okay, I, I can go do this. And I remember Dr. Al's incredibly uh, generous with his information and time. I was on a meeting with you, remember, like a month or a year and a half ago. And I was so impressed by what I was hearing when he was consulting our team. I emailed him and he sent me a book over and was like, check this out. Um, and it really helped me to start thinking more about what you just said regarding marketing. We assume that everyone is like us and they're not necessarily. There's different groups of people. That's why you guys have probably seen the whole like uh, the client avatar thing. Every marketer's is uh, learning about that now or every coach is learning about that now. Who are you making content for? Um, so my question for you really is, how did you get into this? Because clearly I, I know you, it's a passion for you. It's not just something that you do because you're bored. You're obviously passionate about it. So when did you realize that you thought marketing was interesting and, and when did you want to make it an expertise? So great question. So about 20 years ago, 23 years ago, I actually invented an exercise device and I found an angel investor who gave me $6 million. And of that $6 million, I went ahead and wrote and starred in my own television commercial. In those years, there was these long form infomercials that ran about 20 minutes. And I had the opportunity to work with some of the top marketing people in the world. And I realized, wow, I really love this. And so I had, as I said, my own television commercial. I got the marketing bug. And at that time, I started doing research on what was called brain-based marketing, which was a great combination of my neurology background and the marketing aspect. And I said, wow, this is really, you know, I'm really aligning with this. And I decided at that point that I could reach a lot more people in what I wanted to do, which at that time was, of course, in the health space, just as you're in the health space. But I realized I could reach, reach a lot more people on a much larger scale. And I, as it turned out, I had the propensity to be able to do a good job with marketing and slowly started developing a, a client base. And now I have clients all over the world and I'm very thankful they pay me lots of money. And ultimately, as a result, they get a lot of results as a consequence. But what I share and what I teach them, it doesn't matter if you have a business doing $50,000 a year or $50 million a year, as long as there are people involved, the same general principles always apply. And people think, well, I'm only a small you know, practitioner. I, you know, I, I have to deal with it. No, there's no difference between what you need to do to get those yeses, quote unquote, than someone who gives me a budget of, you know, $150,000 and says, we want more clients. Mm -hmm. It is really the same thing. The difference is how much you spend to accomplish that. And sometimes the small practitioner, the practitioner who's maybe doing 50,000, 75, 100,000, wants to do 100,000, actually has a unique advantage because they're not seen as this giant corporation. Mm. And something that you said in the beginning was that um, there's this distrust that on a lot of levels that people have for almost everything now, you know, and so when you're speaking to somebody, you actually have a greater likelihood of getting those people to work with you because of the personal element than a large corporation does, even though the same rules apply in both cases. Yeah, very well. The world is shifting and it's shifting rapidly. And especially I see this all the time in my generation, right? I am shocked by how many, it, it's not even just how many people have come to me to work with me over time. It's how many people don't even ask my credentials as I started to learn the marketing thing. They have no idea whether or not I have a college degree. 90% of them don't even know I'm an FDN and they don't know what that means, even if they did. They just exactly. know oh, this guy can help us. And I'm like, okay, that's when I knew I started to learn the marketing side because the conversation stopped becoming, where did you go? What did you do? How did you learn this to, 
okay, where can I sign up? And, and it's really interesting how that works out. So um, we have 24 people just hopping on live with us today on a Friday afternoon, which uh, is great. We only started doing the live ones a couple months ago. So thank you guys cool. for tuning on. If you have questions as we go along, feel free to drop them in the chat and I should be able to share some of them at the end. But at this time, would it be appropriate for me to bring in some of the slides and we can go with what you prepared? I'm going to do the slides a little later. I want okay. to talk first. I'll give a little, a, a little sort of preview of what we're going to talk about sure. on the slides. I think it's important. So there's a couple of concepts I wanted to really emphasize today because I think it'll help. Um, and I think I want people to realize that the about the challenges that are not unique to being a small business owner or a small practitioner. And one of them is, and this is really a big one I want you to really wrap your arms around, is making the invisible visible. I call this making the invisible visible. And here's the reason why I say this is critically important. And I'm also going to preface it by saying, if you're an FDN practitioner, I'm assuming that most people either listening to this are an FDN practitioner or considering being an FDN practitioner or whatever it is. But realize that the, the concept of being able to do lab testing where you have an outcome, a graph of some time and place gives you a unique advantage over anyone else in the health space. And, you know, when people go to a, a general practitioner, their primary care physician, whatever it is, those people really understand that. They may not understand how to fix anybody, or they may not understand what health is, but they understand the tool of doing a lab test. They understand the tool of doing an x-ray. They understand the tool of some kind of di diagnostics <clears throat> excuse me, that they could show to the patient because that falls in the heading of making the invisible visible. So let me give you an example. Everyone knows, and I could show you like thousands of articles on why exercise is important to do. The research on exercise and longevity is endless. You can go on Google right now and type in exercise and, and longevity and spend the rest of the weekend looking at those things. But 80% of the population do not exercise. So why would that be? And the reason they don't exercise is because they can't really see the end result of that exercise, the end result of longevity, they don't really understand that that's going to take me somewhere. They're always dealing with instant gratification. What can I do now that's going to give me some type of gratification? Sure, I could exercise, but that's so far down the road. Now, this applies in everything. So let's look at the financial world for a second. So they know that at one time when 401ks, which is, you know, you work for a corporation, they give you the opportunity to put money away in what's called a 401k. When those started, what they said to people was every month we're going to ask you how much money do you want to put away in your 401k um, to save for retirement. Now realize that most of the population never has two nickels to rub together by the time they retire. And why is that? Because every month when it came time to, well, how much you're putting in this month, the person would go, well, this month's a little tight for me. So what I'm going to skip this month and I'll put it in next month. And what happens is there's always a problem. There's always a challenge. There's always an inability to put that money away because they really don't see the importance of it because it's invisible, the outcome of retiring. So what they decided to do was they decided to make an employee choose an amount that every month, no matter what they're saying, will be deducted from their salary and go into their 401k. That allowed people now to have a, a greater likelihood of being able to do that. Same thing with weight loss. You know, people always want to lose weight, but when they see that chocolate sundae on the menu when they're at a restaurant, they just want that instant gratification, even though they know they need to lose weight. So if we take a look at some way that you can make the invisible visible to somebody, you have now changed the entire game for them wanting to work for you, work with you. So if you can do lab testing, which is great because you can as an FDNer, you now have a visual scale that you could say to them, here is where you are and here's where we want you to go.
And if you repeat repetitively do that occasional, you know, doing those labs over again, you now are showing them the progress they are making. And when you can make the invisible visible, that client will not only continue to work for you, but they will become evangelists for what you do. They will run around telling people that you've literally showed them and that you could do it for their friend, their family member, whoever it is, to literally show them where they are. And now you've changed the entire game that no one really in the health coaching space really knows how to do, except if you could do the FDM lab testing. I think it's it's self-evident, right? Because we all know if we go through the course as a practitioner or we post something online, it's it's one of the things that has always worked best for me. I kind of always make this joke that if I lost everything tomorrow, the first thing that I would do is just go on my own social media and post my lab results. And again, that's not their lab results as the client, but what it does is it, it attracts them in a way that I've never fully understood. So what you just said today actually makes a lot of sense. When I share a food sensitivity test or a gut test, and I'm just talking about myself or another client, it's not like I'm talking about the person who's looking at it. Every single time someone Facebook messages me or Instagram messages me says, hey, how can I do some of that? And then, of course, I give them the discovery call link and we're good to go. But also, if you go through the FDN course, we include labs in the cost of tuition. And the favorite part of the course for everyone that goes through is the initial one-on-one -on -one mentorship sessions where you get to see your own lab results. There is something... Um, it's just that might be in most of us, right? We all kind of want to know what's going on. And if we could see these things sooner, one, we can prevent a lot of disease states for people long term. But I think it explains what you just said, at least explains a lot of human nature. If you could see the lung cancer on the first cigarette, no one would ever smoke cigarettes. And yet we still have millions of people out there smoking because they can't see what's going to happen. Um, and it's so true what you said about the retirement thing. I got lucky to I start reading some personal development books at around 18, 19 that talked about the long-term advantages of it. I still didn't apply it right away. I'm, I was learning about it, saw the consequences from uh, these words that I was reading and still didn't apply it right away. So yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's something that we can all relate to when you bring up multiple categories like that, exercise, the lab stuff, um, the finances. Most of us are, are not doing so well in at least one of those things. So the more visible we can make it, the more it works. And it is a unique advantage that we have as FDNs. Yeah. And, and one other thing, which is also really something worth considering is, is that, you know, there's lots of disease processes that don't have a symptom. Uh, let's blood pressure for an example talk about something that's invisible there's a lot of people that die because they don't realize that they have a, a, a hidden problem and if you're working with a client and that client now is is all of a sudden their symptoms go away you haven't gotten them to achieve the level of health that they really can, you know and when someone comes to you and then they're having a problem, they will tell you, you tell me what to do, I'll do it. Whatever you say to me, I'm going to do it. But that's because what's visible is the symptom. But now you have a challenge as, a, as an FDN or as, an, as a health coach. And that challenge is you have a great tool to get rid of the symptom. But what you've done is made the visible invisible. So they come with a visible problem, their symptom, their pain, their challenge, whatever it is. You use your FDN tools, whatever tools you use, and now you take that symptom and it goes away. And now they're saying, well, why do I still want to work with, you know, Evan? I mean, I feel fine because you have to keep making that invisible and you made it invisible, visible, and lab results give you the ability to do that. So it's really an important concept. I want to talk also about, and then we'll go to the slide deck maybe after this piece, um, is I want to talk about who your real competition is in the health space. Because a lot of people think, well, it's so challenging to build my practice. There's so much competition out there. There's, you know, all sorts of health coaches. There's all sorts of people in the functional medicine space. There's all these potential things that I'm up against. It makes it very challenging. And I want, I think it's important to talk about who the real competition is because it's nothing to do with the other practitioners. That's really amazing. You know, when someone comes to me from a business that I do marketing for them, they always think that the competition is someone who's selling the same product or someone selling the same service. That's never your competition. And in fact, if you were selling, you know, a product as an example, 
you know, people have a tendency when they come to me, this is what they want to say in their marketing. Our product is better and it costs less. Well, that means you believe the competition is your is the other company who does what you do. That's never the competition. So let's talk about what the real competition is. And then let's talk about how to take what we've talked about, about invisible, invisible, and talk about competition. And then let's talk about what it takes to really get people to go ahead and work with you and get them to say yes, if that works for you, Evan. It does work for me, definitely. <laughs> okay, cool. So here's who the real competition is. The real competition is, one, status quo. So, and and if, I don't know if people take notes during these things, but I will tell you that I would take notes. So status quo. So people have this deep-seated bias for wanting things to remain the same. So if you're doing something that's unusual, or at least what they may think is unusual, the reality is that they may not be sure that what you're offering is what they need. Because if people just are more comfortable, you know, why do people stay in bad relationships? They stay in bad relationships because they think it's, they might be being tortured, but they feel it's safer than the unknown. And that's how people really are. The status quo, at least they know where they're going. Now, the problem with you as a practitioner, when you're dealing with the status quo, the normal reaction for the status quo is, I'm going to sell them harder. I'm going to really convince these people they need to work with me. And so you really press what you do. And that never works. That never works for anyone. And we're going to show you what works in a minute. You also then go over, yeah, but what I do is better because of A, B, C, D. And that, again, never really works. The other thing is, is that some people use fear. And the fear element is, well, if you don't do this, you know, right now you think that you feel bad, but if you don't do this in six months, you might be, you know, not be able to get your health ever back again. And when you can't sell fear to someone who's already in fear because they're not feeling well, and they, like Evan, you said, they might have gone to 10 other practitioners and haven't gotten any results. And now you're trying to scare them. They're already scared. And when someone's squared, scared, it triggers the, the, a part of their brain called the amygdala. And you can't think clearly when you're scared, you know, and not to get into, you know, people use fear to get people to do things, take things that under normal settings they want. And we've been through a couple of years of that is what you know. And then ultimately, we try to sell them on the co the, what the cost of, of inaction is. In other words, some people call this fear of missing out. And, you know, you see that in finances in the stock market. Oh, I better buy NVIDIA because the stock's going through the roof. And even though the stock might have already done its run, people have a tendency to buy things after they've already, other people made money and then they wind up losing money. So f fear of missing out doesn't motivate people at all. So you have to realize that your real competition is not other people doing what you do, but the number one competition is status quo. The number two competition, and this is a battle between the two, is what's called indecision. And now this is important because 40 to 60% of the people that you talk to will not decide to work with you because they'll be undecided. And here's the reason they're undecided. And this is really interesting. Remember, I just said, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. Well, that's not really their greatest fear. Their greatest fear is what I call FOMU, F-O-M-U, fear of messing up. Am I going to make a decision that's going to be worse for me? Am I going to do something that's going to really make me go down the tubes? In other words, people are really afraid. And then as a, in business, you see it as, well, if I'm in business and someone wants my company to start using a new program or a new cloud base or something, and I make that decision and it go, doesn't work well, am I going to lose my job? So because of that indecision, they stick with, well, you know what? I'm going to stick with what I'm doing. In your business, in the health space, it's the same thing. Their fear of what they're actually going to make a decision of working with you if they're not sure is maybe I should just stick with what's going on or maybe I'll go back to my primary care physician or, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm on 
practitioner number 10, maybe not you, but practitioner 11. So you have to get past the status quo, which is what the, ultimately that first reaction. And the other thing is the fear of messing up. Is this going to work for me or is it going to make it worse? And one other piece, and then we can really go to the slide deck if, to share that. And that is a lot of times there's another person involved in making that decision. So let's say it's a couple. I'm just using that, you know, and maybe you're speaking to the wife um, or maybe you're speaking to, you know, in, in, I shouldn't say wife. And it may not be appropriate to even use the term wife or husband in these day and age. I don't even know what terms are appropriate anymore. But anyway, the other person, you know, the significant other, whoever that person is, they might be the person that you think I need to ask, should I do this or not do that? And realize that that's important for you to dissect who really is the decision maker in this situation, because you could be talking to a person and spend a lot of time trying to get them to want to work with you. But then they're going to leave that call or that initial you know, contact that you have and go to somebody else and say, this is what the person said. And you know, what do you think? And that person, without even knowing what you do or who you are, they're going to take what they even remembered about what you said. And remember, when someone's in fear basis, they don't think clearly. And you, if you use the terms that are too you know, scientific or that you're trying to convince them by making an argument that is based on so-called research, and I'll tell you when, when you should use research, by the way, then ultimately they don't remember any of that. And the only thing they remember is what you said about how much it's going to cost them. So they go to their significant other and they say, well, what did, you know, Dr. Al say, I'll use my term, or what did, you know, Detective Evan say, F say, and they say, um, he said he thinks he can help me. It's going to cost $4,000. And the other person who has no idea what the hell you were talking about says, well, there's no way we're going to do that. So you need to be able to, number one, deal with the real competition and determine who is it that really is a decision maker. And at that point, say, you know what? I really want that person with you when we have this conversation because they're going to be an important piece of this decision. So you want to try to engage the right people to get someone to say yes. You could be talking to the wrong person all the time. So um, so I wanted to get that going on right off the bat so that ultimately um, we can go to the slide deck and um, talk about that it's, and, and look at those slides and talk about how do you get people to make decisions if that works for you. Yeah, it does. I mean, I could comment probably on everything. The one thing I love is the FOMU. I'm going to remember that for a while. <laughs> uh, and you know what? I think that's something as practitioners ourselves, right? So we're talking about it from this client perspective, but as uh, practitioners and business owners ourselves, we need to remember our own fear of messing up because it, this has been different for Maddie, my fiance, as we've done business stuff together, because she was never in that before. And she's been surprised by how much like, Long story short, we have an in-person business. I've been testing out some different, uh, you know, marketing stuff for that. Look, that's and we're spending money on it. And some people just bombed with it, right? It sucked, like it did not work at all. And then yes. two weeks later, I'm spending on someone else, and she's like, "What the heck are you, you doing? Like it didn't work last time." I said, "Well, I'm not just doing it impulsively. Like I make sure that this is actually a new type of thing." But the way I look at it, because I think we do get so scared of messing up. I, in business or whatever it might be, you have to accept that that's going to be part of the journey. I'm like, all I need to do, it's like Mark Cuban says, all you need to do in business is win once. I said, if I go through 10 of these people or 10 of these agencies and nine out of 10 suck, but the one wins, then the other nine, it doesn't even matter. Now, again, you don't want to say that to your client in the sense of, hey, you want to go through nine health practitioners. They're not going to want that. But um, you know, some of business involves investing in ourselves and, and kind of taking some risks. And I think that needs to be applied in entrepreneurship. So that's just a, a little side note because I really like that acronym and it's something I'll totally, remember. Totally, totally. Yeah. Thanks. Totally. All right, I'll bring this up for you here. Okay, do you actually yeah. see the slides, you think? Yeah, I, I see the slides fine. We got 34 people live. If you guys don't mind, just even a few of you, can you comment and uh, say if you see the slides fine? We should just be little boxes now at this point, Dr. Al and I. Oh, that cool. Is. That's great. Okay, yeah, good. I see looks how that good. looks. Okay, fantastic. And if anyone has any questions that they want me to address while we're going through this of, of the audience, I'm happy to do that. And a lot of people, as you said, 
Um, they actually are going to watch this after it's live, right? Because we do archive it on uh, right on YouTube. Yeah, yes, sir. And everyone um, so far has said everything looks good, so we're fine. Okay, cool. Okay. So the first thing I want you to realize is, is that there are really two parts of the brain. Here is the, the sort of neurological aspect of it. Realize this. There are two parts of your brain. One's the rational brain and one's really the emotional brain. And people always make decisions based on the emotional brain, the older brain. They don't make decisions based on their rational brain. Now, that's a really important concept for you to grab. And the reason it's an important concept to grab is because most people try to convince people to do something by appealing to their rational brain. Now, in, in brain-based marketing, one of the things that they tested was they used functional MRIs and they could see what part of the brain lights up when people are put in certain situations to know what part of the brain is the most appealing to them. You know, years and years and years ago, um, and they did a focus group where they played before he was known. I'm, I'm hoping that... Um, People know who this is, but they played um, Barry Manlow songs to a focus group. I don't know if you, you, you've heard of Barry Manlow, yes? Dr. Al, I feel terrible saying this. I've heard the name. I couldn't tell you what he does. That, that's okay, well, a that's lot about of people, the generation I'm in. Yeah, so he used to play piano for Bette Midler, and then he became hugely, hugely successful musician and singer and whatever it is. But he's real, and no offense to him, but he's really schmaltzy. I mean, so they put him in a room, and he's so schmaltzy that they asked people, would you ever buy this music from anyone, Barry Manlow? And everyone goes, no freaking way. Are you kidding me? This is schmaltzy. And the brains were lighting up going, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy this. And the guy, like, you know, has made millions of dollars, you know, uh, from his music. But people, if you ask them, you know, their rational brain wants to say, no way. But their emotional brain was loving it. And the same thing happens here. So you always want to appeal. You always want to appeal to someone's emotional brain, not their rational brain. So what are the best ways to appeal? to their old brain or their emotional brain. Realize that their emotional brain, one of the top elements in their emotional brain is, it's about me. They want to know what's in it for them. They don't care what's in it for you. In other words, in any of your marketing and talking to people, tell me what's in it for me. What are you going to do for me? What are you offering for me? It may be great that you lost a lot of weight, and it might be great to tell me all the clients that you helped, but you need to learn how to listen better to who they are, you must learn to hear what their pain points are, and then you must direct your conversation to what's in it for them, because that's all anyone cares about. The other thing is, is that the emotional brain is very, very, um, has a great appeal for contrast, positives and negatives. And so in the conversation, you want to drive those different points. In other words, it's not always going to be, you know, sunshine and roses. You need to contrast to them potentially what you've heard from them about where they were, what they experienced, the outcomes they had. you got to learn to listen and be able to contrast the experience of what it's like. I'll give you an example in the FDN course and don't go doing this for years and years and years with Reed. Some people talk about um, some people talk about finding the real cause of what the problem is. In other words, deep down, you know, we're going to get to really what the cause of it is. And in, in FDM, where we talk about metabolic chaos, we may never know what the real cause is because the truth of the matter is, every system in the body, every part of your brain affects every other part. So, and you may not know the actual, you know, cause of that one thing that started the cascade of problems that you have. So you need to deal with all of them. So the contrast is, is somebody, you know, who says, oh, we're going to get to the, you know, root of your problem, the root cause, when in fact, no one may know the root cause. And that's probably not the best way to do it when you can go ahead and you can contrast that. So that's important. The other thing to realize is that people have a great, the old brain, we're the decision-making brain, 
people have a challenge dealing with language because language is not was is is a fairly new concept so they deal much better with visuals than they actually do with written word you'll notice on the slide deck the slide deck it's mostly images and very few words where some people when they do a slide deck this got like every word they're going to say on the slide the problem is people read faster than they listen and if you make slides or you do a presentation that's all text the end result is they stop listening to you so you always want to use more of images and what are the best images for someone that you're looking to work with lab results that's all images no matter that there's a lot of results on that page people love to see lab results because it it uh, aligns better with the older brain where they make their decisions so visual stimuli like lab results and i just threw this thing up so that you could basically see it but your lab tests having lab tests doing lab tests are a golden ticket to working with clients i can't stress that enough it's you know the the most successful practitioners in every field not just in the health coaching field whether you are a primary care physician a chiropractor a neurologist whatever it is those lab results that you could put in front of a patient are the gold that you have to work with oh what happened to there we go we lost one of those okay so what drives what was it let me go back one there you go so what drives the old brain and is really beginning for safety and attention um and here's why i want to say that what you present in the beginning when you meet with somebody what you talk about in the beginning and i talk about this as the attention retention curve what you say in the first three seconds of your call and what you say at the end of your call is going to be the two most important things. They won't really hear what's in the middle. So let me give you an example. And you see this every day. <clears throat> if you're on Facebook or you're on Instagram or you're on TikTok or whatever it is, um, I'm going to hold up my phone. I don't know, Evan, if they could see my phone. Can they see it? It's I'll small, it but they my... can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is what people do all day long. They're just flipping their thumb and going from image to image, video to video to video. And you really have three seconds to engage people because if you don't engage them in three seconds, <clears throat> this is the attention part. They are Their minds are somewhere else and people now have an attention span of a flea. So as a consequence of that, you need to open up that conversation by really going ahead and getting saying something that's going to affect them their ability to listen to you and then at the end of the conversation doesn't matter what you say in the middle pretty much at the end you want to sum up what you think is the most important part based on the opening that you did so the attention retention curve shows great attention when you first start talking then they lose you or you lose them and then what you say at the end so they leave that experience that conversation <clears throat> excuse me, with a beginning and an end. So the attention and the retention is critically important. Okay. So we know that what drives the old brain is pretty much emotion and all decisions are made on emotion. I don't know why this does this. Okay. So let's talk about, there are six S's, I call them the six S's that people um, are attracted to, especially the old brain in making their decision. For some reason, this is, I don't know why, they're here are the successes. I sort of have to go back and forth. I apologize for that. I don't know why this and is doing that. Actually, Dr. Elb, I don't mean to cut you off, but just while we have a second, some people had complained about my big head uh, being in here because it does, it kind of cuts off the slide a little bit. So oh. I think I can actually, oh, no. Nope, Could you take both of us out of it? I don't need to be here Yeah, either. okay. I think we can, let me see. Nah, what see, if I mute? If okay, I take what if you I, out, it will unfortunately, it'll. Well, how about if I do this? Too. How about too. if I do this? Oh, it no, just, just, yeah, yeah so I I'll remove okay, myself, sorry. but I'm here with you, I promise. <clears throat> okay, and you know, worst comes to worst. Oh, that was pretty cool that you did that. I don't know how you did that, but that was terrific, by the way. I did, but then That's I lose cool. audio for a second. That's the issue. Okay, so <laughs> stay on there. But what I will do, if it works for you, is I will make it available if anyone touches base with you after the show. I'll make the slide deck available to them. They can, you know, watch and read at the same time if that works for you at all. Thank you very You guys... I don't think you guys realize how much an hour of this guy's uh, time costs. So that would be amazing. Thank you very much. 
Okay, cool. All right, so let's do that, and I'll keep rapping on, and then you know, hopefully, they my big head is not blocking the. Um, although my wife says I have a tiny head, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, so with that, so here are the six S's that appeal to the old brain: survival, safety, security, sustenance, status, and sex. These are the six S's. You should write these down, or at least when you get the slides, you'll be able to look at them. Whoops, let me just go back to here. Sorry about that. And let's see if the slide blanks out, I'll go back and there you go. So let's look at some of the most famous and successful marketing campaigns ever. And some of these you will know, this is called Got Milk. It was, you could see that every, it was all famous people that had a mustache from drinking milk. The, the, the marketing just said Got Milk. And the reason it was popular was because it appealed to people's survival and sustenance. And so ultimately, two of the six S's, remember there were six, 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 six S's, and this one appealed to that. By the way, the Dairy Council, when they came up with this ad campaign, said, we can't use this as a campaign. It's not even grammatically correct, got milk. And as a consequence, they was one of the most successful for the, for the dairy industry. I won't tell you how I feel about people drinking cow's milk, but that's a whole other story. Let me go back to this one. Um, yeah, so then there was the famous American Express one, never leave home without it. Um, I don't know if people ever saw that commercial. I'm probably older than everyone on this channel. Um, and that was also appealed to security and status. Two more of those six S's. The feeling of security and being able to have an American Express card. Whoops, sorry. How about this one? Michelin, so much is riding on your tires. Some of these, I hope that you've seen these, but the point I'm making is what makes them successful. They're not saying I have better tires. That's not the appeal. It should not be. Um, and uh, Kimberly, thanks for saying that she remembers these. So Kimberly, that was great. Let me go back to this. And Michelin, of course, is, you know, safety. And that obviously is what they were selling there. Again, I have to do this back and forth. Fly the friendly skies of United. And again, this is crazy, survival and security. So that was what appealed there. Okay, a diamond is forever. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that, that commercial. I think it was a diamond store, actually. And that, of course, is, again, status. It looks like these go blank, and then when I hit the button. And Victoria's Secret, which you know what they were selling. Um, I don't have to tell you that, and that that was a very very successful. But what other thing about that is, is that I'm going to just go in this direction. People associate children, babies, believe it or not, which are very very popular on the internet. They associate babies, especially newborn babies, as the sexual part that appeals to them. That's because obviously, you know, the, the connection there, but if you don't have to have naked people, although there are a lot of people now on Instagram and, and, and TikTok that don't have a lot of clothes on, and it's very popular for some reason. Um, but ultimately, children fill that same um, emotion, the emotional um, connection there. So, um, and then um, again, they look at that as sex. Uh, again, I apologize. And of course, pictures of pets. I'm a pet owner and people look at animals, cats, especially, it seems like on social media, safety, security, and sex. So ultimately, they look at those three things. And obviously, this picture represents that. Um, and now the six S's and for decision makers. Okay, so realize this, that this is how you relate to people in the six S's. I gave you the six S's, and now think about this. People avoid pain more than they seek pleasure, and that's a survival mechanism. So really, you want to think about the six S's every time you speak to a client, or when you determine how you're going to deal with that client. Remember the first thing I said is, not the first thing I said so much here, and I can't say the first thing, but ultimately realize that you really want to listen to what the people are telling you. They're going to tell you their pain points, and you're knowing that they want to avoid that pain. So ultimately, it's a survival mechanism. You want to gear the conversation, especially your initial conversation, with understanding that these people want to avoid pain, which is one of the reasons fear is not a good tactic. They're already under a lot of fear. And obviously, this is a dentist, which is one of my least favorite places to be. 
up. Oh, let's see. If we, oh, okay, let me get past. Okay. Primary voters are fear and anxiety. So they want survival, safety, and security. Now realize I said before, they're motivated by fear. That's why they're talking to you. But fee, giving them more fear is not a strategy to make them work with you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, safety and security. I'm just going to run through these faster. Your ability to communicate, that's an important thing because it really is. And, and we talked about this a little bit before. I don't know if you know who this um, person is, Stephen Porges. He came up with the polyvagal theory on how to get patients to feel safe. You could look him up online. He has a book called uh, on that. And let me just see if I can get to the next one. This is kind of crazy. Okay. So the only, let me sum up and then we can go back to, you know, talking and get you back on the screen here. So the only way to really get inside the head of the person who's the decision maker is really via those six S's. Now I want to, if we could shut the slides off, Evan, could we do that and bring you back on? Cause I want to talk about a couple of, yeah, that'd be great. There okay. We go. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, are we doing okay time-wise? I know I have a tendency to rattle on here. But... I'm doing fine. This is this is a master class right now. So you're keeping the audience. You're keeping my attention. We're good. As good. Okay. That's fantastic. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> so I want you to realize that it t emotionally is what triggers people to work with you. You must appeal to that. The challenge, of course, is, is that we all feel like, well, I'm going to convince them to work with me based on all the research that's out there on whatever. But we already talked about that people don't exercise and there's more research on exercise than anything in the world. I mean, literally, you know, there's enough stuff about poor diet being, you know, one of the causes of health problems and still people eat processed food and, you know, super processed food and fast food and junk food. It doesn't motivate them. So here's where the rational piece comes in. Now, this is really important. Where do you use those rational tools? And one of the things I want to tell you also is if you appeal to someone's rational brain first, here's what happens. Number one, they think, oh, wow, Maybe I need to do more research before I do make a, a decision. You're telling me about all this research, how great this is, and all these studies and all everything else. And they're sitting there going, God, I don't know any of this. And maybe I need to learn all this stuff, you know, before. You no, know, there's a reason that people let you drive automobiles, test drive an automobile in a in a an auto dealership is because there's nothing like the emotional aspect of being behind the wheel and feeling that car, getting the new car smell. That's all emotion. You know, if, you know they don't take out the spark plugs and show you the gap. You know what I mean? Li it's literally a consequence of appealing to emotion. But here's where the human brain needs that rational documentation. I've now made a decision to work with you. Now I want you to make me feel good about that decision. Now I've already made the decision. Well, now here's the research to back up why your decision was so smart. So now they feel good about what they decided to do. Oh, well, not only did I decide to do this and I'm excited about doing it, but there's so much information that's backed up of what I'm doing. Now I feel good about that. I made that decision. So the, the rational stuff, the documentation, the studies, the research, and all those things are necessary, but they're necessary on the back end. It like locks them in. It takes them away from what are called, and you've heard this terminology, buyer's remorse. Oh man, I just decided to spend $8,000. Is that a good decision or not? Well, if you leave them hanging, they're left with, I just decided to spend $8,000. That's not a good thing. But if you left me with the decision, now that you spent $8,000, look how smart you were. Now I'm locked in. Now I want, that's, I'm so happy I made that decision. So there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. There's the pieces that you have to realize who your competition is. You have to realize the aspect of making the invisible visible after you've made the great discovery that, oh, wow, I made the visible invisible. They were in pain. They felt like hell. 
felt like crap and now they feel great and they think, well, it's over. Now I'm done for where you have to really know how to handle that. Also, you now know that the status quo is where they all go to immediately. And you also know that in decision, the FOMU, the FOMU of making missing, you know, messing up is a big one. But now, you know, if I appeal to that six S's, the emotional piece, and then I'm going to add one more piece to this. I'm going to sh shut up in case you want to jump in here for a second. But I want you to realize that all these are part of the process. And it doesn't matter if you what you're selling or how expensive, whether you're selling cars, insurance, health, doesn't matter. All you have to use the same tools. The tools work always 100% of the time if you master those tools. I. Well, one, thank you for all of this. I think what I want to do is is tie it all together um, and then we can leave people with some stuff today. I, I'm, but I'm thinking from a very personal perspective. One of the things I try to do on here, Dr. Al, is no matter what the topic is, if I can relate to it, you know, show people what that looks like. And I'm thinking even for myself, you're, you're talking about these six S's and I'm looking back as, as to what my main motivation was when I got my health under control because I had like seven different diagnosed conditions and the one motivating one more than anything else was cystic acne. Now I had other ones that I was told were incurable. I'm going to lose hearing one day. I'm going to need surgery. I'm not saying I wanted those things, but the acne got me more than anything. And I think about, well, why? Based on what you just said. Um, I could almost say it's two things. The, the status and sex are mixed in, right? Because yes, unfortunately, yes. if you don't feel confident about yourself, um, you're looking down on yourself. So you already lowered your status. And the other part of that is, let's just be real. Like we're, we're talking straightforward here. Other people might look down on you as well. And so then the sex side is, it, you know, I don't want to use that word, right? But from a mating side, let's call it. As a young 20-something-year-old male, the last thing you want is a face full with cystic acne. I want to be able to go out and date. Now, the problem for me is once I figured it out, I'm like, damn, I'm still ugly. Uh, but at least I was <laughs> a little better off than I was before. And, and those were the main motivating factors, though. It wasn't that, oh, wait, I have seven different diagnosed conditions. Maybe 30 years from now, that means I'm going to get a cancer or something else that could really end my life. I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking, I want people to look at me and respect me, and I want to be able to go talk to some pretty girl and say hi without blushing and feeling embarrassed or inferior. Um, so these core things, I think, can be applied to our own lives if we all just take a second to think about why we did certain stuff. Now, with that all said, where I want to make this practical is a very common uh, niche for a lot of our FDN practitioners. It's not the only one, but it's the most relatable one. They might work with women who are in their 40s, um, dealing with some hormonal stuff. They might have one or more autoimmune issues. And again, this content can be cool. It, it is interesting to see an Instagram post that says, oh, women are seven times more likely to deal with autoimmunity. That That's great. But if your feed is only that stuff, you know, now you're talking about just the research and you're not connecting to the main motivating factors that might get them moving. Uh, so I'm coming from this elementary perspective of hearing what you're saying and trying to apply it. So I'd like to be corrected if I'm wrong. I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe the content should have been more around what are the consequences for a 40-year-old something woman that's dealing with the hormonal issues? Maybe she feels like she can't be there for her family. Uh, maybe she feels like she's not attractive anymore if she has uh, you know, a husband or something like that. So it's not that we want to use that against them in the marketing or use that in a manipulative way. That's not what you're suggesting today. But am I on the right track here that that's the type of stuff we'd want to more focus on um, to get into those six S's? Or at least how would you go about doing it then? Yeah, so I think that's really a, a great question. And I think you really hit the nail on the head because you really need to show that you are, have the ability to for them to associate that you understand what that challenge is. You know, it's like someone if you said you had, you know, acne and it was a motivating factor for you. The reality is there's lots of people with acne. And if you start, you know, dissecting the acne of what's causing it, ultimately it's very interesting, but I don't really give a crap about that. I want to, like you said, be able to, you know, not have that be, you know, how people see me. It's the same thing with that. If you are, let's say a woman that's, and looking for that as your client, then ultimately you want to appeal to the fact that you know what that experience is because you've shared that experience yourself and you could certainly talk about what might be causing that and ways to eliminate that. But the reality is 
someone understanding that you're empathetic to the circumstance they're in is much more appealing. Now, it doesn't mean you don't want to say the other, deal with the other thing, but the ratio might be 10 to 1. You know what I mean? To appeal to that emotional challenge they're dealing with that you understand. That's, you know, focus groups, you know, go in that direction where, you know, whether it be Alcohol Anonymous or any of those things where they re want you to realize that you're not the only person dealing with this. And ultimately, they deal with those things on an emotional level. I interesting story. When I was 17, I'm going to tell you a quick story how I got into chiropractic. When I was 17, I had most of my life, I had torticollis. So my head was like this all the time. It was clicked to one side. And when I was 17, I'm starting to think, well, I want to start dating. And whenever I talk to somebody, they do the same thing with their head to match mine. Because you have a tendency, you know, it's like if you, and you know, if someone has a pimple on their head, people stare at it. If your head's locked in one position, they start tilting their head to talk to you. That doesn't feel really good. You know what I mean? So I was looking for a solution to that. The solution wasn't that my head was stuck. It was the solution was what the outcome was having my head stuck. Yeah. So it's the same thing. So I would say, yes, you want to appeal in that kind of circumstance, mostly on the level that they realize that you could identify. Because if someone is dealing with that and they go to an endocrinologist who's going to throw you know, a prescription for whatever medication they believe would help them. They're in that office and thinking, this person doesn't even know what I'm talking about. They have no idea what I'm dealing with, where if they come to you and you offer a solution for that and they come there already thinking, this person has a has some type of understanding that I what I'm going through and my challenges and what it's like to be dealing with this, you're halfway home. And that's the successes. That's the emotional piece. Okay. I think this really explains for our practitioners too, why, you know, FDN of course does not treat anything specifically. In fact, the whole, the whole goldmine of the philosophy is that we don't treat anything specifically. Sure, sure. Business is different than our FDN philosophy. That's why we want the niche and who we're attracting. So then to, to get this really practical for people, I'm trying to think of what I would do on a discovery call that might be different while also still being ethical. Because I know our practitioners, they're amazing people, uh, just like both of us were pretty cool. And we don't want to get on a call and be like, Hey, you know, you're ugly and you're never going to date and you need to sign up right now. That's not the approach we want to take, but where we can relate to the person. It sounds like I, I know as someone who's dealt with cystic acne, I know unique pain points that the average person might not even be thinking about. I'm not suggesting that other conditions couldn't think about this, but it's sure, not sure. everyone. Um, I can say, I know what it's like to check the mirror a hundred times in a day, literally just to see the same thing that you saw before. Um, I know what it's like to dread Thanksgiving, Christmas, and other family holidays, <clears throat> not because I don't like my family, but because we're going to have to take a family picture again. And I don't want to be, I literally am dreading that for weeks before I go. So yes. is, is it correct to say then on a discovery call, I might say rather than beat them down with that stuff, because I don't want them to feel negative, but I want them to know I can help them too. If I'm talking to someone who booked in with me for a cystic acne thing, you know, just sprinkling in there throughout the conversation that say, Hey, listen, man, I get it. I know what, I don't know what hundred percent your life's like right now, but I'm guessing that you probably dread the family pictures. You're checking the mirror a hundred times a day. Uh, maybe you've even stopped dating because of this. We can help get you to that other side so that you don't have that stuff anymore. So can you use it in an empowering way like that? Not a scare the crap out of them. Like, <laughs> yes. And I'll give you a prime example. So we just, you and I just did this live where you okay. said, well, I had cystic acne and I was able to, you know, the challenges I had now let's make believe you were my client as an example i re made you relate to how i understand when you go through those challenges of dating and the things that are on your mind hmm. i just happen to use my head being tilted to the side if i was also dealing with cystic acne i might have then used an example to be able to say what my challenges were relating to what you said so you reveal to me what it was if i was on a call with you and if I was someone who experienced what your challenges are, what your experience, I would then just be able to throw something out that would make them feel, wow, he does understand. I'd use something else as an example, but I, it was, this end result was they both relied in something in the successes. In some way, they related to sex in some way. You know, and so I think that's important. But one other thing I think is important is that the person that is – Having the call, in other words, the practitioner, needs to listen. Don't assume 
that, oh, yeah, they have the same challenges as me because I had cystic acne. So I'm going to tell them, you know, the 30 things that I dealt with with cystic acne, and they're not giving them the opportunity to tell me. Got it. I don't want to psychoanalyze this too much. And by the way, this is the last chance, guys. If you have any questions that you want to ask Dr. Al, please drop them below um, and we'll give you an opportunity to do that. Um, But one thing I wanted to say, because I wouldn't have read into it this deep, but I genuinely mean this. It was actually interesting to me when you brought up that example of your head tilting, especially since I only know you now, because I've always seen you since the day that I met you through FDN, hyper successful, um, very confident person has a beard that I can only aspire to grow one day. And, um, you know, so I'm looking at you as this authority figure, which I would still look at you as, but you almost yeah. just brought it back down uh, to a human level where I'm like, Oh, Dr. I was once like me in a different way, but okay. He struggled with that too. I would have never guessed that because I only see yes. him as this way now. <clears throat> um, and I think this is a huge thing that our practitioners need to remember because so many are walking around um, in this energetic, vibrant state of health, which I mean, I'm thankful to experience almost every single day now, but when you were in it, man, you weren't like that. And so we need to almost bring ourselves back down uh, if no, for no other reason other than just relatability to let them know, no, I'm, I'm not just this crazy energetic person I am now. I was once you and I can bring you with me on this journey. So um, really cool, really insightful stuff. Do you have any I'll have a specific question for you to finish up, but do you have any final words of wisdom? Um, And I don't even know, I think you're here today out of just your own goodwill, because I don't even know if our practitioners could afford someone like you in their marketing, but is there anything that you offer that you want to shout out or where people can find you? Well, as it turns out, I'm not selling anything. I have nothing to offer. I have... I, I'm very fortunate, as my mom would say when she was alive, knock on wood, or even, I don't know if there's any wood anymore in the world. It's mostly pseudo wood, I guess, but uh, artificial. But ultimately, I'm, I'm not here to sell anything. I am, uh, you know, I've been in the health space now for 40 years. Um, I've been through the FDN course twice myself. I'm, you know, very locked into you and, and the FDN people. And I'm really just here here to share there's nothing in it for me other than sharing. Um, if I was selling something, that would be great, but I have nothing to sell. I'm, you know, cool. very fortunate about that. So it's really more offering people, you know, what I think is important for them to really understand and know. Awesome. And are you okay for a couple more minutes? If we did have one sure. question pop up? Sure, um, sure. Uh, so just a comment real quick. Someone said you have so much to offer. Thank you. A pleasure to chat with you and be in your cyber presence. Uh, that's awesome. Cool. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, how do you gently approach potential clients who want to overshare and take more time than allowed in the meeting while sharing their stories? What a question, Kimberly. I could tell she's out there actually doing the work because that's a real life question. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that's a great question because I will tell you that it, that is something that you learn with experience because a lot of the people that you work with, and I, I have one of the unique things about the clinic that I ran was that I treated very, very seriously ill patients. And a lot of those patients would come in with a shopping bag of supplements from all the practitioners they saw. And when you start the conversation, they would want to tell you, I'm not saying this facetiously, it was true, what they first experienced in the womb that they thought, you know, they really want to go back to that history. And you really have to, in that moment while that's happening, you have to sort of propose to them, what is it that if I was, if you, if I was to wave a magic wand from this conversation, what would you like to get out of it? It refocuses them on what they really want. In other words, although the history is important in some ways, how they see the history is not nearly as important as ultimately what they want to get out of this. So if you could refocus them on what is it that you're trying to accomplish today in some way, it will then get it back on track. Otherwise, they win, you lose, and you're spending hours listening to stuff that's not even pertinent. So that's a great question. question, yes. Yeah, well, and it's and it's real life, and it comes up. And each case, you almost have to navigate a little bit because we need to be human. We got to hear that's right what they that's went right. through. Yes, um, but at the same time, there was an interesting um, doctor on Dr. Amy Apesian. She actually had said to us. I mean, she studies trauma. She said when people are just reliving the trauma, that's actually not the most effective way to even deal with it. So maybe that's a, a good way to, or a good thing to add mm-hmm. in here too. You're actually not serving the person uh, by letting them just do that. We have oh, the opposite. Now. Yeah. Showing that yeah, it's the not opposite. helping. 
Yes. Um, and, and it also redirects one other thing. And I, I, I and really, I thank Kimberly for the question. It's such a great question. And that is realize that, as you said, it's not really serving the person at all. And in fact, it's probably once you refocus them, they're thankful. Oh, I do. There is a reason I'm here. And I'm so glad you want to know what that reason is, because <laughs> everyone else listens to the long story that doesn't give you anything to work with. Right. It looks like um, that might be all for the questions. People just love hanging out with us, apparently. So I have a final question for you, and then we'll hop off here. Uh, again, I think I speak for all of us. And guys, please, uh, you know, we're not doing this just to get comments. It doesn't help me out. But if you appreciated this today, please just put thank you in the chat. So Dr. Al knows uh, that this meant something to you guys. I know some of you already have, but please just leave a thank you in the chat. Um, so with that said, Dr. Al, normally the signature question on the show is regarding something around health, which, of course, someone like you could answer. Uh, but I want to propose something different today. I think it's a good one. So I want to ask if you could get all of our practitioners to do one different thing in their marketing. So what I mean by that is if you could get them to start doing something in their marketing or stop doing one thing in their marketing, what is the one thing that Dr. Al would get them to do? Well, I think we covered that and that would be to really, uh, two things really, I think, but it would ultimately be to realize that People are emotional beings and they ultimately relate and make all of their decisions that way. And the biggest thing that you could do for them is make the invisible visible. You can't do anything else but that. And the fact that you have lab testing as a tool gives you a, a unique tool that very, very few people in the space have. But I always say that stop trying to appeal to their rational brain. They don't make decisions that way. They leave those conversations with thinking, I need to do more research. I need to, before I can make a decision about this, I would say the number one thing is stop being so rational. Dr. Al, thank you so much for your time today.